In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. Dun, dun, dun. I'm sure all of you have been um, glued to the television screens this week on ITV4. It's been the Isle of Man TT. Has it, has it, <laughs> I take it, you mean you haven't watched it? Well, you can still watch the reruns. It's well worth watching. Um, just in case you don't know what the TT is, TT is the 37.7 mile course around the Isle of Man on public roads. And it's not a race against other races, it's a race against the track. The current record, I think, stands at um, 100. 32.82 miles an hour, or something like that. Um, so it's an incredible rate of knots these guys travel at. Um, many of the motorbikes are, which interests me of course, um, are, have been specially designed, but many of their motorbikes are actually stock motorcycles, which you can actually buy out of the store, which is quite amazing. And uh, there's actually another program that's been recorded, I didn't tell my wife, as a documentary that was on last night, if you'd like to come watch it with me. And it's all about exactly what we've been talking about all week. Wouldn't it be nice to see the ordinary people, not just the people who are professionally there to, to ride, and see the sort of journey that they travel? Um, and that's, on, that's actually going to be watched tonight. So if you want to come around, please feel free. I'll plenty of tea and coffee. Um, but it's quite an amazing thing to watch. You know, it depends on the start, how they start off. It depends on how they read the road. Um, and actually, if you're a newcomer, you have to go on a, a newcomer's um, welcome trip. And you have to go, you have to be briefed. Of all your kit has to be checked. You have to be taken around on a bus, around a track. And they insist that you ride around the track several times before you get to know it, because obviously the road changes all the time. Now imagine a road like Beacon Off Road just up here, and they're traveling at speeds up to 190 miles an hour. It's just quite amazing. Of course, the road's closed off, there's no traffic or anything like that. But one thing that struck me, and there's one guy who actually dominated the, um, the podium this year, uh, no surprise, a guy called Michael Dunlop, and he was riding a, a BMW. Um, and it, it was obviously a better bike than the other bikes, but he's an outstanding rider. But we were noticing as we were watching him ride that actually he seemed to take chances. And there were moments where there were two motorcycles, 190 miles an hour, and there was the smallest of gaps and he was through. And it was something the commentator said that really stuck in my mind. He said, not necessarily in this order, but TT racers have got a mixture of bravery, of skill, and of commitment. And that kind of rang a bell with me because actually that describes how we should be as disciples. There should be bravery, there should be skill, and there should be commitment to the call on our lives. That's not your headings this morning. That was just came to me as I was standing there watching one of the hymns, and I don't know why I thought about that while we were singing a hymn. But I don't know about you, but as you read the gospel, I don't know if it really clicks with us that this is actually the story of ordinary people just like us who are sharing their testimony, talking about their journey. And this is its strength, the strength of the gospel and its appeal. And that's why the early church grew so rapidly. And that's why the, the church today should grow just as rapidly. And it's a kind of a, a good indicator to us as to why the church is not growing the way it should. It's because we're not bearing testimony and perhaps the way we should. Or maybe it's our journey that needs to be re-examined. Maybe this gospel isn't as real to us as we'd like to think it is. The gospel is the story of God in Jesus Christ, changing lives and changing the world. Look at verse 9. He says, the true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. And we are to be what? Verse 8. Look, we are to be witnesses to the light. Now, this is something other than natural light that John is talking about. 
Was it Jesus says in John 8, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Mary and Joe and I were talking about this the other day. You know, when Jesus said that, it was an incredible time at the Feast of Tabernacles, you know, and they were celebrating the goodness of God. And I'm sure we'll come to it one day. I'll maybe even touch on it. But as they take up, the water is poured out on the temple steps to signify the thanksgiving to God for being, being fertile, providing the fertility for the crops, etc. And then these great big lamps will be lit. And it... The priests, and I'll probably tell you again, but the priests used to take off their trousers and roll them, tie them into wicks and put them in the oil at the top of the lamps and light these lamps. And it said that there wasn't a courtyard in the whole of Jerusalem that wasn't affected by the light. There was no shadow everywhere. Nothing was hidden. Everything was lit. And in the midst of that, Jesus stood up at the face and says, Ah, yeah, but I'm the light of the world. <clears throat> Now that's powerful stuff. That's the awesome God, isn't it? Now can you see how that affected these people? There's all the drama and all the energy that's there. You see, the fact is, Jesus is grieved because humanity loves darkness more than it loves light. And it's still true today. Darkness gets more pressed than the light. Evil sells, doesn't it? Just look at the newspaper. What do you see? How much scandal? Well, I'll tell you what I did this week. I bought a newspaper, I really do this, but I bought the Chronicle, okay, well, I thought it's a local paper. Front page, Roulette Ronnie's Gun Rage. That's a headline. It would be nice if it said, Church Helps Old Lady Across the Street, wouldn't it? Let's turn over the page, hang on, oh, I made it wet. Then. Okay, here we are. Double spread. Our most dangerous streets. And it says here, two city centre streets have earned the un, un, unenviable title of being the most, the northeast's most violent postcodes. There's something to be proud of, eh? Right. Man is stabbed in the chest. Good reading, eh? Right, okay, that gets you going, doesn't it? And there's so much oh, I could go on and on and on. Why do you think when you're riding along the road and there's an accident, so many people spend time rubbernecking? Because they want to see the badness, don't they? They don't want to see the good. They want to see about blood and gore. Do they really care about the people in the road accident? You see, without physical light, we would be in a mess. We wouldn't be able to see for a start. Do you know, if the sun suddenly burnt out, how long do you reckon we would have? How many? Five Nearly eight minutes. That's not bad, is it? Huh? We would have eight minutes of light and heat left and then planet earth would slip into a permanent deep freeze and even if we were prepared for that kind of darkness all kinds of problems social and political would evolve now there's a lot of people in our society today who suffer from a, a light deprivation disorder and it's called uh, and it causes mood swings and depression and the scientific name for it is called seasonal affective disorder or sad People suffering from it get panels put in their home so that they can get enough illumination to get them on an even keel. We've got a friend who's actually has a problem with depression and that, and she has to have a, a doctor's chip to, so she can go and get to the sunbed on a regular basis. That's a good prescription to have. Eh? But you see, we need physical light. We can't survive without it. But our souls depend upon the light of God because we live in a spiritually darkened world and God uses us as his witnesses to point out the light that he gives. So what does that mean? Well the Apostle Paul actually takes us back to the Old Testament imagery. Now look with me if you would to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. If you've got a Bible quickly, if you haven't got a Bible, wriggle up next to someone who has. You're going to need a Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 18. Now listen to this. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory which come from the Lord who is the Spirit. Now what he's talking about there and the picture that he's drawing is taking us back to Moses in Exodus chapter 34. 
Do you remember the story when Moses was up on Mount Sinai and he came down with the Ten Commandments and his face was so radiant with the presence of God, the Shekinah glory, that people were afraid of him and they fell on their faces and worshipped him. And he said, don't do that. And so he put a veil over his face. It's only when he went into the presence of God, into the Ark of the Covenant, that he actually unveiled his face again. Now what Paul is saying is, look, we are in the presence of God. We participate in the divine nature. How many times do I have to say that? If we know the mind of God, then actually we should have that Shekinah glory. Does anyone feel they've got the Shekinah glory this morning? And we don't need to cover our faces anymore because the glory of God shines out through our witness. Because it becomes evident that God is real. You know, I remember one lady, I was um, in Edinburgh, I was the student assistant at Carabas Close Mission in Edinburgh. And I remember I taking this evening service and there was this lady sitting in the middle of the congregation, the place was packed, and she had white hair, but she just glowed and it was an unusual, I'd never seen anything quite like it, until I found out who she was. I'm not going to mention her name because I wouldn't embarrass her, I know it's gone on camera, but... The fact is, this lady had been present at the revival in Lewis. And she'd experienced the presence of God in such a way. And still, after all those years, she was just... It was an amazing thing to be in the presence of. Now, I've been in the presence of many Christians and experienced the same thing. Not necessarily in a physical sense that they shone or their eyes lit up or anything like that. But the fact is, I've known the presence of God. How many times have you walked along the street and you say, I know he or she's a Christian? You could just tell there's a witness in your spirit, isn't it? See, the fact is, we all have gifts. We all have the ability to come into the presence of God. And we all have the privilege of being able to reflect this light to others. The light has always been there. The light has never gone away. But those who are in sin or despair, they sit in darkness. They can't see the light. And that's where you and I come in. You are the light of the world, says Jesus in Matthew's Gospel. We are reflectors of that light. It's a bit like, you know, when you've got the kids in the car and they're all bored. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And it's a night time. And I used to say, have you seen those magic signs? And they said, what signs? And I'll put the, the, the brights on and the, on the headlights. And the, and the signs would light up and the kids go, oh! that's amazing well it only lasts two or three times but it's an amazing experience isn't it when and you know you've kitted them on but that's exactly what we're meant to be we're reflectors of that light this is the true light the light that came into the world the light that made christmas the light to whom john the baptist pointed when he said he must become greater i must become less john was a witness he came to testify to the light, and we too have been called to the same task. Can we think of anything that is more noble or right? I can't. Well, it's a heading for you if you want it. A witness has a unique view of holistic spirituality. It's a bit of a long one this morning. So just how confident are we in the evidence that we have? You know, I read a very amusing um, story about the first Duke of Wellington. And an inventor came to see him uh, with what he made was a, a bulletproof waistcoat. And he said, I promise you, it will save you if a sniper tries to get you. And he says, oh, you're really confident in this. He said, yes. He said, would you put it on? Let me have a look. So the guy put it on. He said, what do you think, sir? No, no, he was shining it rough like this. He said, right, okay, call the rifleman in. And the man ran for the door. See, confidence in the product is essential if we're going to make a sale. But for us, confidence in Jesus makes our witness real. We've seen enough courtroom dramas, haven't we? We know that a witness is a valuable asset because he or she has seen something crucial that could either convict a criminal or set an innocent person free. Our testimony of Jesus is absolutely crucial as well because actually it can mean life or death for a soul that is hanging in the balance of eternity. Do we realise that? I may have told you before about the man who was 
an older chap who was dying in an old folks home and he'd lost his power of speech and he was almost paralysed but he was paralysed in fear as well and about because it could communicate this poor guy he could communicate with his eyes with blinks and I went in early as of the morning and I actually cleared the room and I got by his bed and I said sir you don't know me but I'm the local Baptist minister and a look of fear in his eyes I said look I know you're scared you're gonna die soon and I'm here to get you to heaven and I was there to pray with him and he acknowledged with his eyes that he'd made that commitment now you know it's not always like this not everyone knows their 11th hour so that chance conversation that you've had with someone on the street at work at the shops it could be the last conversation they have that actually could mean life or death for them spiritually that's how vital our testimony is but before we proceed with that point we have to realize that we can't witness to something that we've not seen or experienced and so we have to ask ourselves a question don't we have you seen Jesus have you experienced him in your life you know so many people are meeting churches on a regular basis who at some time or another have professed faith maybe they've even said the sinner's prayer but they've never actually met Jesus they've become devout they've built up disciplines and prayer and Bible study they've they've learned the religious language of the church and they've learned to spiritualize just about everything to remain plausible but who at the same time have this two-dimensional contact with God that has never really developed into a relationship and a friendship that is actually three-dimensional and what I mean by that is this it's a relationship that's all-encompassing and it's an experience that accepts us in our humanity and which clearly doesn't require grudging duty but a glad obedience because Jesus is someone that we know he's our teacher our brother our friend our healer and our Lord all of those wrapped into one after all what kind of Jesus does a flat black and white two-dimensional experience being witness to well I'll tell you an out of reach out of touch savior who is irrelevant to human beings and to a continually evolving society and if we continue to encourage with this kind of spiritual death then we're above all men and women to be pitied it's a lady called Marva Dawn who wrote this traditionalism is the dead faith of the living whereas tradition is the living faith of the dead. In the worship controversies between the traditionists and those who are contemporary, I'm opposed to both polarities. I want the best of both sides, she says, since the church's treasure house is filled with both new and old. And since our congregations are linked to all God's people throughout space and time, I love that, we need both continuity with our heritage and constant reformation using new faithful forms. Isn't that great? It suddenly opens up the playing field because nothing is wasted. Because all of us are relevant. Because all of that experience we've had in the past has become the now. And all that becomes in the future is affected by the past. It's prophetic again. Past, present, future. And we're all a part of it. Don't you just thrill in that? And all of this is dependent upon our relationship to and with God. Because you see, without the intimacy and relationship, there can be no reformation. There can be no spirit-filled activity. There can be no true worship. And yet somehow, the Christian church is missing the boat time and time again, simply because it won't make itself vulnerable to the movement of God the Holy Spirit. And we make all kind of excuses, living in our Walter Mitty um, world, and we think and imagine that we're doing the right thing, but we ignore the Spirit of God. We make up new names. We try to achieve different things, but it's all in our own strength. I was involved, well, not really involved, but discussing with a church a few years ago. 
um, who were so busy. I mean, an amazing place, a grown out of a proportion. And they had several pastors and they had a big staff and they had all these different ministries going on. And I said, yeah, but what does God want you to do? And he says, I oh, ain't got time for that. That's not exactly what you said, but that's more or less what they were saying. We haven't got time for what God says. We're too busy doing what we're doing. And that is the same across the board with the Christian church. That is why the place is empty. That is why our society carries on on a Sunday as if it's just another day. We spend our times in fruitless discussions and endless activity and sometimes all God wants us to do is to be still and know that I am God. That's a hard place to be because we're naturally activists, aren't we? We want to do something. You know, in the, in the last 20 plus years, there's been an explosion of interest in spirituality. I can remember going into a shopping mall, and it was, um, I think it was Menzies, and uh, they had a whole window full of New Age books. Okay? So I walked in, I said, really pleased with your book display. They said, you, you like it? I said, yeah, brilliant. I said, but I, I didn't realise that you were allowed to do sort of religious stuff, so can we have a Christian bookstore next week? And they said, oh no, we can't do that. I said, all right, it's spirituality, isn't it? People sense there's more to the existence, you see, than what they can see. And so their homes have become full of collectibles. The homes have become full of technology and all manner of desired things. But, you know, folks are crying out for something more. Something that can't be bought. Something that can be experienced. They want it. And the ultimate question has become, who is God? And can he possibly relate to me? And can I possibly relate to him in any way? You know, in 1995, that's not so long back, is it? A lady called Joan Osborne produced a song called One of Us. I don't know if you've heard it. It won seven Grammy Award nominations and it made a virtually unknown singer an overnight sensation. It's an amazing song. It's a song of spiritual questioning. And actually, I don't know you feel, David, but every time I listen to it, I hear something different. But that's a good thing about the song, and I think that's why it grabbed people's attention. And she said, it's about conceiving God in a modern age. And this is what she says, if God had a name, what would it be? And would you call it to his face? If you were faced with him in all his glory, what would you ask if you had just one question? Oh, that's a good verse, isn't it? And then he says in the chorus, what if God is one of us? Just a slob like one of us. Just the stranger on the bus trying to make his way home. Now these lyrics, they concern some conservative Christian groups because of their irreverent tone. And because the song's popularity amongst young people seemed to imply a complete absence of faith in the God of the Bible, I don't believe that. Now I'm not claiming that this song has any of the right answers, but the question that folk are beginning to ask again and again, now that things don't seem to hold all the answers anymore, what if God was one of us? That could well be the most important question of our age. And it's a central question in all of history. And the answer to that question, if it were realised primarily by the Church of Jesus Christ, would do no less than change every conceivable aspect of life for people on planet Earth. And if you don't believe me, read Acts chapter 1. See what happened there when God the Holy Spirit met the believers and humanity, warts and all. And despite the difficulties of culture, despite the persecution by powers beyond their control, they were causing frustration to those people who were trying to stamp out this spiritual fire that was growing and growing and growing. That is what I mean by wholesome and holistic spirituality that in the stuff of life changes the world forever. <coughs> And it starts with us. And they're great. You don't have to agree with me. God. <laughs> Do you? you know, when I read my notes sometimes, I think, I wonder what their faces would be like on Sunday morning. All good. <laughs> see, a witness has a unique view of holistic spirituality. We can see it. And it's not far beyond our reach, and we should be leaning towards it. 
Because you see, secondly, a witness has a living message. Now, if you're invited to a court of law as a witness, you're not called to the stand just to look fashionable. You're there to share your testimony, aren't you? A witness has something to say. But you have to ask, are they actually saying anything? You know, I've heard far too many Christians say to me, well, I don't have to talk about my faith. I just have to show my faith. Well, that's a fair comment. But you know, the same people don't have any problem talking about their job or their favourite restaurant or about the football game last Sunday or the latest computer upgrade. But to speak of Jesus, well, that's another matter, isn't it? Sure, we've got to show our faith. Jesus said so. What did he say in Matthew chapter 5? In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. But in Mark chapter 8, he said this, If anyone's ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with his holy angels. There's got to be a balance there, hasn't it? It's not enough to talk, we must do. And it's not enough to do, we must talk. Responsible witnesses come to court, that's the action, and they share their testimony, that's their talk. But we're not all called to be witnesses in the same way. And maybe we just need to ask God to give us the opportunity. You know that story, don't you, of the man who was a bit timid. And he prayed every morning, Lord, give me an opportunity to witness to someone. I really need to pray. And he, this went on for weeks. And eventually he was sitting on the bus on his way home. <coughs> and it's, it was mostly empty, but he was sitting on one of his side seats. And then this great big bloke came in and he sat next to him. And he went, mm. and he was praying, Lord, give me an opportunity. Lord, give me an opportunity. And suddenly this big man burst into tears. And he cried out, I need to be saved. I'm a lost sinner and I need to be, need Jesus in my life. Won't someone tell me how I must be saved? And he turned to the Christian and he said, could you show me how I could be saved? And do you know what he did? Lord, is this a sign? <laughs> Now, that's a funny story, but you know, in reality, that's exactly what we do, don't we? Because we want the sign that we want. In fact, I've got a great picture. I wish I'd put it on the screen. And there's a great big poster, big blank poster. There's a little a push bike up next to it, and at the bottom it says, well, you did ask for a sign, God. <laughs> Sometimes God just wants to, us to engage our sanctified common sense, you know. He wants us to be aware, but if we're witnesses to the light, actually... We sense it, and we know it. And every one of us has a bit of a tell, don't we? You know when people play cards, they have a tell. Everyone has a tell. You know instinctively, and I don't know what it is for you, but certainly for me, when I know, and I've been privileged to see a few people birthed into new life, and you know, I get this sense at the back of my neck, and I just know it's gonna happen. It might be different for you. I don't know what it is, but I tell you, it's the most amazing thing because you know God is doing something. And it's time to shut up, Bob, and let God do his work. You know, in the book, I don't know if you've read the book, The Contagious Christian. Has anyone read that? Oh, good man. Well, this one, at least one, right? Okay. Bill Hybels and Mark Mittelberg, they discuss how different personalities shape evangelistic approaches. He said, a Christian professor, they say, might use an academic intellectual style. Someone on the streets would use something a bit more confrontational. <laughs> I'm thinking of what you said last week. Someone that's a homemaker. You know, they, they talk to their neighbours. They might use an interpersonal style. Someone in a soup kitchen might use a service style. But the point they're making is divergent people with divergent styles and yet all witness to the same life-changing reality of Jesus Christ. Surely... In recognising this diversity, we should be filled with confidence because we live in the assurance that God has chosen us the way that we are and is willing to change us from the inside out to accompany us through the difficult situations that we're in and to, and to help us to enjoy our life, to enable us to share our new life and actually to share our new life in Jesus in the way that we can do it best. I can't witness the way that you can witness. And that's why we're dependent on each other. What an incredible relief from the straitjacket of institutional evangelism that says, we must get out and preach the gospel. Mary and I were members of a, a Brethren Assembly for a number of years. Fantastic place. We learned so much. 
But their weakness was evangelism, and they would admit that. And their evangelism program consisted of once a quarter delivering some tracks around the doors. They didn't even organise the tracks. Someone delivered, a central body delivered them, and then we went out and delivered them. And when I said, well, why don't we go out and knock a few doors and invite folk to the church? Oh, we can't do that. <coughs> you see, by recognising our unique personalities and giftings and by engaging them in a natural witness, we are bringers of life and a life that is real. And it's not a formula that expects us to conform. If we are witnesses, we have something to say and God will use our own style to say it. Because we have a unique view of holistic spirituality. And as witnesses, we have a living message. But, do you know, a witness must take the risk. A bit like a motorcyclist. Imagine you've gone 190 miles an hour and there's a two-foot gap and you can get your bike through it. Are you going to take it? It could, be mean, 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 it could mean winning the race. You know, if we were told to put ourselves on a witness stand in court, it could possibly mean exposing ourselves to a real brutal cross-examination. In extreme cases, it could mean physical danger. Because you might be given some kind of damaging testimony. You know, look at the, look at the witness protection programs there are operating in different countries because people in former terrorist groups or organised crime. Being a witness, you see, can open you up to all kinds of danger. And being a Christian witness is not an easy thing to do, but it's meant to be a natural activity to us. You see, in ourselves, we would rather be private, wouldn't we, and personal, and keep things to ourselves. That's very British of us. The bottom line is, actually, I'm going to say it, we're afraid. We're a bit afraid of ridicule and rejection. And we're frightened that someone is going to think that we're intolerant, or maybe we're insensitive for sharing our faith. But you see, that's the challenge of taking the risk. The challenge is that we have to be thinking Christians. That we have to be up to date with theological and social trends so that we can build bridges in a contemporary way. And the risk is that we have to challenge the ethical and moral substandards that are operating freely and which are as seen as normal in the world around us. Being able to respond in an educated way dispels the myths of intolerance and ignorance that are levelled at us on a regular basis. You see, being a witness for God, it's never been easy. But you know, if you were to read the latter part of Hebrews chapter 11, you think, we got it tough? Those who testified to the true light were mocked, flogged, thrown in prison, hid in caves, sawn in two. John the Baptist, who we read about in John chapter 1, had his head chopped off of being a witness to the light. But you see, that's where the rubber hits the road, Christian. Because too many Christians want an easy life, a life with no fuss, a life with no cross-bearing, and that simply means being identified as a follower of Jesus every day and not just on a Sunday. But Jesus has promised us no such thing. He told his followers to expect persecution and rejection. He said we've got to deny ourselves and take up the cross and strangle those fears. We've got to be identified with him. He said in effect that we would have to die to our bent towards self-indulgence. We must follow him if necessary into a dangerous territory. And that's the real world where there is perversion and cynicism and crooked living full of people who don't act like us or talk like us or think like us. We're in a foreign country. <clears throat> John Drain, in his fantastic book, The Modernization of the Church. Has anyone read that? It's on my shelf if you want to borrow it. Brilliant book. He poses the question, who are we trying to reach? And one of the categories he explores, he calls this group the spiritual searchers. And this is what he writes. They'll probably not know exactly what they mean by spirituality, but one of the ways it will be contrasted with religion will be as an all-embracing reality that can give meaning to the whole of life. Whereas church will be perceived as something that happens once or twice a week in organised services, 
Their spiritual search will not be concerned to find something that will be holistic, affecting not just a, an hour or two on Sundays, but the rest of the week as well. Christians might reasonably re protest that this is a misunderstanding of what the church is supposed to be about, and that the gospel is nothing if it's not a radical lifestyle for every day. But that will cut no ice with the searchers, who see little evidence of that in the life of Christian people. For them, the main difficulty with the church is just its irrelevance. It's lost the ability to speak to them. They're not noticeably anti-Christian. Indeed, many of them have a quiet sense of regret that the church no longer works for them in the way it apparently did for their parents and their grandparents. It's just that what they see of church fails to connect with their experience of life. Now, that's a two-sided argument, I know. We need a kick up the rear end, don't we? Just to say to you now, get your act together. And also, a folk have to be honest with themselves because folk are basically selfish and are looking for their own self-fulfillment. And so they have a responsibility too to understand their need of a saviour. But I wonder, does that describe anyone that you know? It does for me. And what a challenge for us to be secure in our conviction and to throw off those shackles of false teaching of compromise by association and start moving amongst our neighbours where they are. You know, it's a risky business. But we have to be constantly on our guard spiritually. And the possibility of being under misunderstood is there, but surely it's worth it if we can take the light into a dark place. And if we are light of the, the light of the world, a city on a hill where we cannot be hidden, right in the midst of darkness and evil, will we have to shine? So you see, a witness has a unique view of holistic spirituality. A witness has a, a living message. A testimony of how Jesus Christ has changed and continues to change our lives. And finally, a witness takes the risk of, being, of taking the light into the darkness. And we'll continue next week. Mm. Let's pray, shall we? Our Father, we are ever aware of our responsibilities as we consider being light in a dark place. But we will confess to you that sometimes it's just so tough because although we're looking for the opportunities, we don't always see them. And we so want to serve you, but often we just miss the, miss the trick almost because we, we're focused elsewhere. So would you help us today to just revisit our relationship with you? To be still and to ask you to speak into our lives. To be still, to ask you to shape our lives and to be still. And to be clear on the direction that we're meant to, be, meant to go. And rather like people on a journey with a roadmap, sometimes have to stop just to check the route. We pray that you'd help us just to do that and not just blunder ahead. And make silly mistakes because we know that we're not taking light anywhere if we're doing that. We thank you for your love to us, for the fact that Jesus is the light of the world. And he's made us witnesses of that light. We thank you for that stewardship. Encourage us, we pray, to shine for you. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen.